Hello students, today we want to learn about one more very important set of laws related to gravitation and these are known as Kepler's laws. It is a set of three laws which deals with the planetary motion and that is why they are also known as Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So here we want to find out from these laws how do the planets move around the sun what is the shape of orbit and other parameters. Now, if we go back in time, if we go back in history and look at the chronology, actually Kepler's laws were given much before Newton gave the universal law of gravitation. Kepler gave these laws somewhere around in 1610-1620, which is more than 100 years before Newton gave the law of gravitation. But still, I have taken these in opposite order. I have first taught you the Newton's law of gravitation and now we are talking about Kepler's laws. Although in books you will see that uh, even in NCRT, Kepler's laws are given first and then uh, comes the Newton's law of gravitation. The reason behind this is very simple. If we introduce Kepler's law in the beginning itself, then for many of us, it feels very abrupt it feels that this is something very random and what is the use of this, what is the application of this, it does not relate to any other knowledge which we already have. Whereas, if we deal with universal law of gravitation first, then it's easier and simpler to understand because we were, we've already studied that once in ninth class also. And using the concepts of universal law of gravitation, then understanding Kepler's laws becomes easier. It helps us more. Okay. So, uh, that is why, that is the reason uh, why I have taken these after uh, the universal law of gravitation. Now, as I said, Kepler's laws is a set of three laws and we will take each one of them one by one and understand what each law wants to convey to us. One more very important aspect which I must tell you is, at the time of Kepler, mathematics and science were not so advanced as it is today. So, all these laws which we are going to see here were formulated by Kepler just on the basis of the observations of the sky. Whatever he observed, whatever data he had from the observations done by people before him. And when you see these laws, then you will realize how difficult and how challenging it must have been in those times to formulate these laws. Today, some of the aspects of these laws might be very obvious to us, but at that time, it was not the case. So, let's go ahead and look at the first law of Kepler, which is known as the law of orbits. The law of orbits is very simple. It says that planets revolve around the sun in elliptical orbits and sun lies at one of the focus of the ellipse. Let me show you what I mean to say. So, this is the representation of the sun and a planet that is our own earth revolving around the sun. Now, in reality, of course, the size of orbit is much larger than the size of sun or the size of earth. But just uh, for creativity, just for a better visualization, I have shown sun to be very big and earth to be small compared, compared to sun, but still quite big compared to the orbit. In reality, once again, the size of orbit is much larger and sun and earth can be treated almost like point-sized objects when we are looking at the orbit. So, we are saying that all the planets, not just earth, all the planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits and sun lies at one of the focus of the ellipse. Now, I am assuming here that when you are studying this chapter by this time in mathematics, you would have covered conic sections and you would have studied about ellipse in detail. If not, 
let me just take a brief description of ellipse and uh, if you have done ellipse then also very good this will be a quick recap or revision of that so uh, this kind of shape is what we call as an ellipse and uh, there are some terms which we need to know about this shape when we are talking about this planetary motion if we look at the ellipse then we can draw two axes like this the bigger one is known as the major axis and the smaller one is known as the minor axis. This here is called as the center of the ellipse. So, be very clear, sun is not at the center of the ellipse. Okay, We are saying sun is at the focus and an ellipse has two foci. Foci is the plural of focus. An ellipse will have two foci, one here and one here. Let's say F1 and F2. Now, these foci are very important in defining the ellipse. They have a characteristic property. We say that if I take any point on the ellipse, if I take any point on the ellipse, let's say point P, then the distance F1P plus F2P remains constant. F1P plus F2P remains constant. You can say this is one of the important property of ellipse or you can also say this is the defining property of ellipse. This is one of the definitions of ellipse. We can say you take two points, two fixed points and then you decide a distance, a sum total of distance which should remain constant from these two points. Now, you move the point P around in a plane and that will generate an ellipse. Okay? So, we can say that ellipse is the locus of a point for which the sum of distances from two fixed points is constant. Okay? So, uh, these are some basic things which you should know about an ellipse. Major axis, minor axis, half of this is semi-major, semi-minor. This is the center of ellipse. Center is different from focus. Center is where the two axes intersect. Uh, an ellipse has two foci, F1 and F2. And we are saying, now coming back to Kepler's laws, as per law of orbits, we are saying that the sun lies at one of the focus. The sun is lying at one of the focus of the ellipse. And of course, the planet is revolving in the orbit. So, the point P is representing the position of planet in this ellipse. Okay. So, uh, this first law, as I said, it might seem obvious because now this is very common knowledge that planets revolve in elliptical orbits. We have known this from junior classes. We know that the orbits are not circular. But think about 400 years ago, how difficult this would have been because uh, there were even debates that sun is at the center or earth is at the center in that era. Defining the orbit of the planets, looking and uh, defining the shape of the orbit. That was a big thing. Okay, So, this is what the first law states. There is no uh, calculation or formula involved here. Simply, the first law of uh, Kepler, the law of orbits, states that planets revolve around the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one of the focus of the ellipse. Simple. Okay, So, uh, this was just some extra information which you should know regarding an ellipse and uh, if not uh, done till now, you will study about ellipse in mathematics soon and you will learn much more than what I have told you here. Okay, So, this completes the first law and uh, now I will clear this out and we will move on to the second law of Kepler. The second law of Kepler is known as the law of areas. Now, which area are we talking about here? 
So, if the orbit of the planet is in the shape of an ellipse, then of course that ellipse encloses some area. And this law deals with the area swept by the planet or the position vector of the planet. Okay. So, once again, let me just show you what we mean here and then we'll give the statement. So, let's say that uh, once again we have the planet Earth <clears throat> in its elliptical orbit around the sun. Now, we can define the position of any planet with respect to the sun with a position vector, right? I hope you remember position vector from the origin, a vector which points towards the object or the place which we are talking about. So, from the sun, from the center of sun or as I said, in the solar system, the size of orbits is so big that the sun and planets can be treated as point sized objects. So, from the sun, we can define a position vector for the planet and as the planet moves, obviously, the planet is going to sweep some areas, okay. Let's say the planet starts moving like this, it sweeps some areas this way. Let's say it's at some other position, then it sweeps some area in this way, okay. So, that is what we mean when we say that the planet sweeps some area of the orbit as it moves. Or to be more clear, we can say that the position vector of the planet with respect to the sun sweeps some area inside the orbit continuously. Now, this is very interesting. The law states that the area swept by the position vector in equal time intervals is equal. The area swept by the position vector of planet with respect to sun is swept equally in equal intervals of time. So, let's say if planet goes from here to here in 10 seconds, then whatever is this shaded area, that will be the same here also in 10 seconds. Now, at first look, it may not seem so obvious because the shapes do not look identical. This is looking like a different kind of shape. This is looking like a different kind of shape. And we are saying that these two areas are equal. So, how is this happening? Okay. So, that is what we want to understand here. Another way of saying or stating this law is that the aerial velocity, the rate at which the position vector sweeps the area of the orbit remains constant. So, we can define a term here which is aerial velocity and it is nothing but delta A, the area swept upon delta T. Okay. This is the area swept by the planet or the position vector as we said. So, delta A is this area and the time taken by the planet to move from one point to the other in this orbit is delta T. So, this aerial velocity we are saying is constant. Okay. Now, if we Look here, we are using the term velocity and when we use the term velocity, we generally imply that it is a vector quantity. But how can this be a vector quantity? We are saying that velocity must refer to some vector quantity, but here I have area and time, both of which are generally scalar quantities. So, how can this become a vector quantity? So, in fact, aerial velocity is being treated here as a vector quantity. But what is the vector involved here? So, we say that since this area is being swept because of the revolution of planet around the sun, there is a kind of a rotational motion involved and therefore, the aerial velocity can be given a direction as per the sense of revolution. Since the planet is moving this way, as seen in this diagram anti-clockwise, then the aerial velocity will be taken outwards. If the planet was going clockwise, as seen from here, then the aerial velocity will be taken inwards. 
So in fact, this is a vector quantity and we say that the aerial velocity vector remains constant. Okay. So once again, the vector sign here, the vector only represents the direction of revolution. Okay. Aerial velocity is pointing in this direction. Fine. Now, we are saying that this aerial velocity is constant. That means if this is delta A, then this is also delta A. If the time taken here is also the same delta T. And this is what is stated by the second law of Kepler, the law of areas. The aerial velocity remains same throughout the motion of the planet in the orbit or the area swept by the position vector of planet with respect to sun is equal in equal intervals of time. Now, this law has one more very important consequence. If this time interval is very small, it is very simple to see that these areas will be nearly triangular in shape. Just imagine, we are saying that we start from here, that is the center of the sun and this is the position vector of the planet. If this time interval is very, very small, if delta t tends to zero, then we are saying that this area will be nearly triangular. Actually, it's more like the sector of a circle, but still, we can say it is nearly, nearly equal to, nearly like a triangle, this area which we are talking about. Because the base of the triangle will be very small or we can say the arc swept by the planet, that will be very, very small. Now, if we compare these two areas, both taken to be nearly triangular, we can clearly see that this triangle has a longer height but a smaller base, right? This has a longer altitude and a smaller base. Whereas this triangle comparatively has a shorter altitude but a bigger base. The time taken in both is same. This means that the planet must have moved greater distance in this part in the same time. Okay. Clearly, if this base is more, this distance has to be greater. Whereas if this base is lesser, this distance moved is lesser. Time is same. Same time, smaller distance, that means smaller speed. Same time, greater distance means greater speed. And here we get a very important conclusion. When the planets are farther from the sun, they move slower. When they are nearer to the sun, they move faster. So here, the planet moves faster. Whereas here, the planet moves, sorry, uh, there it moves slower. When it is farther from the sun, it moves slower. And here, when it is nearer to the sun, it moves faster. Very interesting. So, uh, this also tells us that the speed with which the planet moves around the sun is not constant, definitely not constant. It keeps on varying throughout the elliptical orbit, throughout the path. And it is the fastest when it is nearest to the sun and it is slowest when it is farthest from the sun. Okay. Now, this law of areas, even though Kepler gave this just by observations, now with our knowledge of gravitational force and other physics concepts, we can actually prove this law. We can find out what exactly this aerial velocity is and we can also show that it will remain constant. So, Kepler's laws now with the knowledge that we have today can be proven. Even the first law, the law of orbits can be proven 
But the maths involved in that is uh, very complicated and that is why it is not in our syllabus. But the second law, the proof of this is quite simple and we, we can use our knowledge of uh, rotational motion, gravitational force and some other tools and prove this second law. So, I will clear this out. We have understood the second law. Now, we want to see how this law can be proven with other concepts of physics. Alright, so let us see the derivation for this law of areas. The first thing which we will have to do of course is find this area and relate it to the dimensions of the orbit. So, uh, what we do is we mark the center of the sun once again here. Look at the position or position vector of the planet with respect to sun. And then as I had said, we treat this area to be nearly a triangular area. Okay. Of course, this is an approximation, but it will be valid if the time interval is very small. So, we have taken the time interval delta t to be very, very small. Delta t is tending to 0. In that interval, we want to find this area. Finding the area is very simple. Half into base into height, that is the area of a triangle. Now, as I had said, since the triangle is very, very small, let me draw it again so that there is no confusion. The triangle is like this. It has a very small base and the altitude is much greater than the base. In that case, the altitude can be taken nearly equal to r, the distance of the planet from the sun, the magnitude of the position vector. We can say that the altitude is nearly equal to that distance r itself. What about the base? How can we relate the base here? The base is nothing but the distance covered by the planet when it goes from one point to another. So, the distance covered by the planet can be related with its speed. And since the time interval is very small, we can say that this speed will remain constant. It is moving with some speed v. So, this distance can be taken as v delta t. Fine. And now in terms of these parameters, the position r, we are saying this uh, altitude is also nearly equal to r. Therefore, in terms of these parameters, I can write the area delta A as half into base, which is V delta T into height, which is r. Okay. And now, we want to find out this in terms of some more simpler parameters. Now, we had said that this area will be treated as a vector quantity. But here, when I write it in this form, there is no vector involved. Although the parameters involved are indeed vectors, we have delta A, which we want to treat it as vector going outwards. Velocity of the planet is a vector. Position vector of the planet is also, of course, a vector. So, how do we relate these parameters? Just look at the directions. R is somewhere here. V is here. Delta A area is outwards. Can you think of some way in which we can relate these vectors? I hope you know the answer. We have done this in the previous chapter itself. We can use the concept of cross product of vectors here. Just see, if I do r cross v, then it comes in the direction of the area vector which is outwards. Once again, r cross v comes outwards. Okay. Now, can you think of some place where we have encountered r cross v or something similar? I hope you remember that angular momentum of a particle was related in this manner. Not r cross v, but r cross p. And momentum p is nothing but m into v. So, we can relate this here, this term on the RHS in vector form with the angular momentum. 
just we'll make a small change. This V I'll write as P by M. So this becomes half P by M delta T into R. Okay. Now in vector form, if I write this in vector form, then I am saying that we can do the cross product here r cross p and then the directions of the vectors will become same. So in vector form this will become and delta t also we can move to the LHS because we wanted to find the aerial velocity. Delta a by delta t is equal to half r vector cross p vector okay this r p delta t is taken on the other side upon m and this r cross p as we said is nothing but the angular momentum of the particle in this case angular momentum of the planet about the sun once again let me remind you for the size of the orbit sun and planet both can be taken as nearly point sized bodies okay so r cross p is applicable we do not have to talk about we do not have to include the rotation of the planets okay so this r cross p can be replaced by the angular momentum l and hence we get the aerial velocity delta a by delta t is equal to l by 2m you can write capital l also or small l also both are fine and this way we have found the aerial velocity of the planet in terms of its angular momentum it is l by 2m where m is of course the mass of this planet but the story is not over here we had to show that this aerial velocity is constant that is what the kepler's law of areas is the aerial velocity delta A by delta T is a constant. We have not shown that here till now. So, how do we do that? We can clearly see on RHS we have two parameters L and M. M is of course a constant. So, if the aerial velocity is to be constant, then the angular momentum of the planet L has to remain constant. Now, can you think when does angular momentum remain constant? This is also something we have studied in the previous chapter. Angular momentum remains constant if the net torque acting on the body is zero. So, we have to show that in some way the net torque acting on the planet is zero. How can we show that? It's very simple. The only force acting on the planet is the gravitational force. And we can clearly see this gravitational force acts along the direction of position vector. Gravitational force is towards the sun and the position vector is from the sun towards the planet. So, the angle between R and F is 180 degrees. The torque due to the gravitational force, tau due to the gravitational force is nothing but RFG sine 180 degrees which is 0. And since this is the only force acting on the planet, the torque is 0 and thus we can say the angular momentum remains constant. Since the torque is 0, angular momentum is constant. Since tau is 0, therefore L is constant. Okay, very simple. And hence we have proven Kepler's second law, the law of areas. The aerial velocity is equal to L by 2m and it remains constant. Okay. So, as I had said, we can use our concepts to prove the second law of Kepler, the law of areas. So, this completes the law of areas. Two laws are done, one more to go. I will clear this out and we will move on to the third law of Kepler. The third law of Kepler is known as the law of periods. 
and it deals with the time period of revolution of the planets around the sun. As we know, the time period of revolution of every planet around the sun is different. For example, Earth takes one year or 365 days to revolve around the sun. Similarly, for every other planet, the definition of one year would be different. But with respect to our one year, it will be either some days or maybe multiple years, several years. It is found that closer the planet is to the sun, smaller is its time period of revolution. So, if we talk about Mercury, Venus, then it will be even lesser than one year. It will be maybe few days or maybe about 100 days and so on. But if we go farther from sun, if we move towards the planets like Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, then it will be several years. So, this is how the time period of revolution is dependent. You can find out the data over the internet. Just search about the time period of revolution of planets. You will get the list and you will get an idea how much it varies from the first planet to the last planet. Now, this is also clearly, there is also clearly some relation here between the time period and the size of the orbit because we are saying that farther a planet is, more is its time period. And that is what was summarized by Kepler in this law. So, let us consider two planets here. Let's say Earth and one more planet is there. So, we are saying that if that planet has an orbit bigger than Earth, that means it is farther than Earth, then its time period will be greater. And if it is closer, then its time period of revolution will be lesser. But the proportionality was not found to be a linear or direct proportionality. It's a little more complicated than that. It's a little different from that. Kepler, from his observations, as I've told you, all these laws were given by Kepler just based on his observations and whatever observations he had from the people before him. Based on these observations, Kepler concluded that the square of time period of revolution is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit of the planet. If I write it mathematically, it comes down to a very simple statement, very simple expression. T square is proportional to R cube or A cube. Okay. Some books use R as the representation and say that uh, T square is proportional to the mean radius of the orbit or mean distance of the planet from the sun. But the correct statement is that the square of time period is proportional to the cube of semi-major axis of the orbit of the planet. Now, I've already, I've already told you this is the major axis. So, the half of this, that means the distance from the center of ellipse, not the focus, from the center of ellipse to one end of the major axis, this is what is the semi-major axis, half of the major axis. So, we are saying that the square of time period of revolution is dependent on this distance. <coughs> If both the planets have different, different distances, then obviously their time period will be different and the square of time period will be proportional to cube of the semi-major axis or the mean distance of planet from the sun. As I have written here, R1, R2 are the distances or the semi-major axis, then T square is proportional to cube of that. Okay. So, uh, in questions, you can use the data as per whatever is given. Sometimes they'll say it is the distance, uh, the mean distance of planet from sun. And sometimes they'll call it the semi-major axis. You can use it with both the data. Okay. Now, based on this, generally the questions which you will get will be proportionality based only. That means, if some other planet has double the radius compared to Earth's orbit, what will be its time period, how many years or how many days it will take. So, such type of questions can be solved very easily. This also implies that 
T1 square upon T2 square will be equal to R1 square, R1 cube upon R2 cube. Okay. The square of time period for both the planets will be in the ratio which is equal to the cube, the ratio of cubes of the orbital radius or semi major axis for the two planets. So, if you know the data for one planet, you can relate it with the other planet also. Okay, this is one way. But if we do want to write the equality relation here, then we have to put some proportionality constant. This proportionality constant and this relation also, as I've told you, can be proven with the knowledge that is known to us now today. But Kepler could never prove that because maths and science were not advanced that much. But now we have the proof of this, although it is not in our syllabus. Proving this for an elliptical orbit is very difficult and the maths involved is very complex. But for an approximated case of circular orbits, this can be proven very easily. And in fact, we will be doing that in the next concept, in the next video. Okay. So, I will give you the proportionality constant here directly. As a fact, you can use it if required in any question. And uh, there might be some questions in competitive exams, especially where you will need the proportionality constant. So, if we continue with this relation and put the proportionality constant, then it is found that t square is equal to 4 pi square upon g m s into a cube. So, the proportionality constant is this 4 pi square upon g m s. Okay. 4 pi square is a constant, g is the universal gravitation constant and m s, you have probably guessed it, is the mass of the sun. m s is mass of the sun, which is also known as one solar mass. Okay. So, m s is this parameter, it is also known as solar mass. Okay. Now, generally, the value of this will be given in the question if required. But if you know the value, it might help sometimes, although 99.9% .9 you will never need the value. But just to give you an idea, the mass of the sun is approximately 2 into 10 to the power 30 kgs. So, you can use this uh, if required, but most probably you will never need to, need to know or remember the value. It will be given in the question if needed. So, this is how we can relate the parameters with each other using an equation, using a relation, not just a proportionality. And as I said, for an elliptical orbit also, this has been proven, but that derivation is beyond our scope and not in syllabus. Okay. So, uh, this completes Kepler's laws. All the three laws have been covered and uh, I hope that uh, everything was understandable here and uh, you were able to grasp what we were trying to communicate in every law. So, uh, we'll finish here and in the next video, we would want to take some problems based on Kepler's laws. And after that only, we will move on to the next concept.